Good morning and welcome everyone. We are delighted to greet you this morning and welcome you to Coopersville United Methodist Church, both in our online campus and at our in-person campuses today. We're a community of Christ followers who are passionate about experiencing God's love, growing in our faith, and serving our community. Whether you're a longtime member, a first-time visitor, or somewhere in between, we are thrilled to have you join us for worship today. Before we dive into our service, here are a few important announcements about things that are coming up in the life of our church. This week, there are a lot of great back to school things going on in our community. Our back to school bash is this Tuesday from 5 to 7 p.m. at Vets Park here in Coopersville. The churches in our community are partnering together to host this fun event that's, that's intended to bless our schools, our students, staff, and families. Make plans to join us for it. It's going to be free hot dog dinner, bounce houses, all sorts of fun. And because of open houses this week, we're not having, we, we won't be having our this week's Wednesday night discipleship classes. It's a week off, but we will be meeting again and starting off a new year on Wednesday, August 30th at 5.45 p.m. And then next Sunday, we're celebrating our back to school Sunday, where we'll be blessing backpacks and the folks that'll be wearing them and praying over our families and students and staff. And we'll also be serving up some ice cream sundaes after the worship service. As we gather here today, let's remember the words of Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Church, let's join our voices and our hearts in worship, celebrating the goodness and the faithfulness of our God as we begin with prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you with gratitude in our hearts. We thank you for the opportunity to gather as a church family and to lift your name on high. We ask that you open our minds and hearts to receive your message today. May your Holy Spirit move among us, guiding us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Let's continue our time of worship today with songs that magnify the name of, our, of Jesus and prepare our hearts to encounter God. Feel free today to sing along, to clap your hands, and to express your worship in any way that's comfortable and meaningful for you. Let's worship.
Hi, my name is Stan Bertog, and I invite you to open your Bibles today as we read our scripture passages. We will be reading Psalm 118, verses 1 to 17, and I am reading from the New Living Translation. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let all Israel repeat, His faithful love endures forever. Let Aaron's descendants, the priest, repeat, His faithful love endures forever. Let all who fear the Lord repeat, His faithful love endures forever. In my distress I prayed to the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Yes, the Lord is for me. He will help me. I will look in triumph at those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in people. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Though hostile nations surround me, I destroy them, all with the authority of the Lord. Yes, they surrounded and attacked me, but I destroyed them all with the authority of the Lord. They swarmed around me like bees. They blazed against me like a crackling fire but I destroyed them all with the authority of the Lord. My enemies did their best to kill me, but the Lord rescued me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. Songs of joy and victory are sung in the camp of the godly. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. The strong right arm of the Lord is raised in triumph. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. If I were to ask you to describe God in one word or a statement, what would you say? God is good, wonderful, powerful, amazing. Uh, God is Father, all-knowing, Lord. All these are true. But it's likely most people, in, in the church and outside even, would say that God is love. We all agree with that one, right? I mean, God is love. Love is the greatest descriptor of our Lord. I mean, that's what it says in 1 John chapter seven or 4, verses 7 through 10. It says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves a child is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Everyone knows that God is love. And that's what makes it so hard to accept when we read about God sometimes in the Old Testament. You know, especially the parts where it seems like God is wrathful, uh, condoning killing even commanding armies to completely destroy whole groups of people. How can God be loving if God seems to condone destruction so much? Well, that's one of the hardest questions we have to face as Christ followers. You know, we ask these questions, or at least we have them, and, and most of us probably are a bit too uncomfortable to actually ask someone about them. But let me tell you, Others in our world, they're asking this question. How can a loving God seemingly hate so many people? Well, you know, I wish I had all the answers to these questions. I wish I could explain why a whole group of people needed to be eradicated in order for the Israelites to take possession of the land. 
I wish I could understand myself why death had to be the punishment for disobedience and sin. I don't know these answers, but I do know this. God doesn't hate people. There is one thing though that God does hate, abuse. I know and we see through many of the stories in the Old Testament that God will not allow people to continue abusing others. And I know that God offers help and deliverance to those who are victims of abuse. And I know that it's far past time for the church to call out abuse instead of covering it up. And we must be a community that offers help to victims of abuse. Now, before we delve into today's discussion, I'd like to offer a heartfelt warning and encouragement regarding the nature of this topic. Today, we'll be addressing a deeply sensitive and serious issue, abuse. Abuse, whether physical, emotional, verbal, or any form, is a painful and distressing reality that affects countless lives. It's a topic that requires careful handling, compassion, and a strong commitment to seeking healing and justice. I want to acknowledge that many among us have, may have personal experiences or, or know someone who has been affected by abuse. The, wor the wounds caused by, by those events can be long lasting. And, and our goal today is not to reopen those wounds, but rather to shed light on this issue, provide guidance and encourage a path toward healing. Now, please be aware that our discussion might include di descriptions of difficult and distressing situations. If you find yourself becoming overwhelmed or, or triggered by the content, it's okay to step out briefly, to seek support, or even to choose to refrain from listening to the entire discussion. Your mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being are very important to us. Our intentions today are to create a safe and respectful environment where we can address this topic honestly, while also acknowledging the potential emotional impact that it may have. If you feel that you need to talk to someone after today's discussion, I am always available to support you. Please reach out. In fact, you can text me anytime uh, during our message today or anytime in the future. Our church texting number right here is 844-453-7363. And I'm the only person that sees these messages, so your privacy and confidentiality will be protected. Now, as we engage in this conversation, let us remember that God is a God of healing and restoration, that he cares deeply for those who have suffered, and, and he desires for us to stand against all forms of abuse. Let's also remember that as a church community, we are here to support and uplift one another as we journey together toward wholeness. Before we begin, uh, let's join in a moment of prayer, asking God to, to guide our words today, our thoughts and our emotions as we navigate this difficult but necessary discussion. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you acknowledging the pain and the brokenness caused by abuse. As we discuss this topic today, we ask for your wisdom and compassion and your healing presence to be with us. <coughs> Help us to approach this conversation with sensitivity and grace. And may our words and actions reflect your love and desire for justice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so as we look at how we can deal with the letdown of those who abuse us, how, how we can help victims of abuse, we can, like always, turn to the turn to the Bible, to God's word. And today we're gonna turn to Psalm 118 to help us understand how we respond to abuse and what we can do in the midst of it to honor God and to tell the world how God helps us through it. Thank you for your understanding and your willingness to engage in this important conversation. I pray that God's grace and truth will shine through us as we seek to address 
abuse within the context of our faith and our love for one another. <clears throat> so the question is, how do we reconcile a God who is love with a God who hates? How do we deal when we feel let down by those who abuse us? Well, we have to remember that God's love is different than anything we can comprehend. God's love is complete and perfect and forgiving, full of grace and compassion, peace and justice. God's love is self-sacrificing and unending. And in that, God cannot and will not tolerate anything that threatens those he loves. So those that use their power to oppress others, those who belittle or hurt or torture or even kill God's beloved sons and daughters, God hates those actions. Psalm 11 verses 4 and 5 says, He watches everyone closely, examining every person on earth. The Lord examines both the righteous and the wicked. He hates those who love violence. Again and again throughout scripture, God tells us how he hates those who abuse and resort to violence and manipulation and, and hurt others. And God works to rescue those victims. That's what the crux of this psalm is all about. The God who is love, the God who is good, who we give praise to for all he has done. This is, this is who we're singing about. And one of the things uh, about the Psalms that we have to remember is that they were written over centuries by, by numerous different authors, okay? Many of them were written by, by David. Um, we know that because they tell us that. Others were written by priests, some by Moses uh, and other leaders. And many, we just don't know who authored them. Psalm 118 is one of those. Uh, many scholars and, and even Jewish teachers believe that King David wrote it, but you know we don't know for sure. What we do know is why it was written and how it was used. This psalm was a song sung by the people as they prepared to enter the temple for worship. The book of the prophet Ezra in chapter 3 tells us that this psalm was written for the founding of the second temple when it was rebuilt after its initial destruction. We're told that those gathered for worship would start singing they'd start singing this song even before they entered the doorway of the temple. And they'd start with this proclamation. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Now that right there is enough of a pro proclamation to repeat over and over again, isn't it? I mean, give thanks to the Lord because he is good. His faithfulness, his steadfast love, they endure forever. But there's more needed. You know, it's not just the leader of the procession into the temple. It's all the people. So, so the, lead, the lead priest shouts, let all Israel repeat. His faithful love endures forever. Let Aaron's descendants, the priests, repeat. His faithful love endures forever. Let all who fear the Lord. And, and understand here that that's a colloquialism for Gentiles who follow Yahweh. So let all the Gentiles repeat, his faithful love endures forever. And as they enter the temple, they're proclaiming the faithfulness and the enduring love of God. Then as they walked through the outer courts of the temple, their song would declare what God has done for them. The psalmist says, in my distress, I prayed to the Lord and the Lord answered me. The Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Yes, the Lord is for me. He will help me. I will look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in people. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. See, this song here, contrasts the faithful love of the Lord and the wickedness of evil and evil people. So the people of God remind themselves that God hears their cries and is bigger and stronger than any of their enemies. They, they remind themselves and they remind one another that it is better to place all their hope in God instead of in other people. They continue their song and, 
and they recall how God has delivered them from their attackers, from their abusers. God is love and God hates that which destroys his beloved. See, the psalm talks about how God helped and delivered, how God saved and acted. Now, the strong right arm of the Lord has done these things and the strong right arm of the Lord has rescued them from their oppressors and their attackers and their enemies and their abusers. Therefore, in verse 17, they will say, I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. Now let's jump back to that question I asked earlier. How do we reconcile a God who is love with a God who hates. Well, remember what I said. Remember we said that scripture clearly states that God hates anything that threatens his beloved sons and daughters. Those that use their power to oppress others, those who belittle and hurt and torture and kill his beloved, God hates those actions. Those who abuse their relationships with others, whether it's physical abuse, sexual, emotional, mental, or spiritual abuse, God will not stand for these atrocities to continue against his people. So as the psalm declares, my enemies did their best to kill me in verse 13, but the Lord rescued me. See, God hates abuse and he offers help and deliverance for victims of abuse, whether it's domestic abuse or verbal abuse or physical abuse or sexual abuse or spiritual abuse. God will deliver his loved ones. He will fight for them. You know, it's heartbreaking to hear the stories of people who are trapped in relationships marred by abuse. According to author and counselor Leslie Vernick, a destructive relationship is one in which the personhood of the other is regularly diminished, dismissed, disrespected, and demeaned. There's a lack of mutual effort at maintaining and repairing relationship wounds. There's a lack of mutual accountability but rather one has power over the other. Now, let me make this clear. Abuse is sinful. God hates this kind of abuse. It's, it's not his plan for us. And if you're trapped in one of these relationships, God's will is not for you to continue suffering and being abused. It's not his will for anyone. Destructive relationships, whether they are marriages or families or friends or any other type of relationships we might have, this is not what God intends for us. God does not either demand that we continue to subject ourselves to them. See, that's what God's love looks like. He loves us um, so much that he refuses to settle for our abuse and mistreatment. Remember the, the worshipers declaring at the, as they enter the temple, my enemies did their best to kill me, but the Lord rescued me. Friends, the Lord will not allow our enemies, whether they're the ones that should be loving us or not, he will not allow them to destroy us. God will rescue us if we turn to him. And God calls his people not to allow abuse to continue either, to, to work to protect and support and rescue victims of abuse. See, for too long, abusive cycles have been perpetuated in the church because, well, because of a variety of reasons, right? Whether it's a misuse or misunderstanding of scripture or some misguided desire to protect the church's reputation or the reputation of that leader. We've seen way too many times in churches that the world and We've seen this way too many times in churches and the world has watched as the church has hidden these abuses or ignored them or even excused them away, blaming the victims and, and doing anything they could to avoid dealing with the stain of abuse. And that must stop. If God loves us passionately and is opposed to abuse, then we must be as well. The strong arm of the Lord does these glorious things, the psalmist writes. And we, as his church, must be just as committed to rescuing the abused and bringing their abusers to justice. And one way we stop the abuse cycle is to establish clear, healthy boundaries. The right to say yes or no. 
See, when life's troubles come, we call out to God and we ask him to help us. And, and then we honor God and ourselves by deciding what's acceptable and what is not. Boundaries, although not the most fun thing, are necessary in every functional relationship. You have to be able to draw a line between behavior that is allowed and behavior that is not. And I want you to hear this and remember this, that no one deserves to be abused, mistreated, derided, talked down to, manipulated, or worse. No one. And if you feel you're in one of those relationships, please reach out, get help now. There is no shame in getting help. In fact, that's what we need to know today in, in discussing how we can learn to deal with the letdown of people who abuse us is, is we start by reaching out and getting help. Reach out to God. Reach out to trusted friends. Remember what the psalmist did? He, he prayed to the Lord in his distress. He called out to God for help and for rescue. And God, using all his authority, all his power, rescued him. God helps us as well. And, and God will guide us to people who can help us. So we need to reach out. We also need to learn, like I said, to establish healthy boundaries in all of our relationships. Healthy people will honor and care for one another, who honor and care for one another, will respect each other's boundaries. When one person isn't allowed to exercise their boundaries, this is a red flag for abuse. And when victims are traumatized by abuse, they may feel afraid to speak up because they're embarrassed or fearful of the consequences. They're, they're worried about the shame or they don't want to be labeled as a, a failure somehow. And oftentimes victims of abuse can experience a secondary abuse as well in trying to speak up and reach out for help and people don't believe them. See, the church should be the safest place for anyone to get help. This is who we will be as a church. We will take people seriously. We will investigate claims if needed. We will stand in the gap and help and guide and guard and do whatever is needed to help all involved. We will not allow abuse to occur in our church and we will do all we can to prevent and end it if we see it around us. See, anyone who speaks up about abuse in our com community will be listened to and believed. Again, if you need to talk to someone because of this conversation today, please, please reach out to me. Again, the number is right here on the screen for you to text us. Text me. And we as a church will respond this way because the God that we serve is love. He's a God of passionate love that allows no room for abuse of his beloved. And we as his people will respond in love, the same kind of self-giving, grace-filled love. And we want to be a people who will bind up the brokenhearted and bring peace to the chaos many endure as a result of abuse. Now, I understand that talking about abuse like this can bring so many emotions and thoughts. You know, we don't understand. We, we don't believe that that person would be like that. We might even think somehow that we deserve what's happening to us. And I say this now with the greatest Christ-like love here. No. No one deserves to be abused in any way. No, we can't always understand it. And no, sometimes our relationships won't last because of no fault of our own. No, victims do not need to stay with their victimizers. No, we will not allow abuse to continue. And no, God will not leave his beloved sons and daughters to suffer alone. What did the psalmist say here? God's faithful love endures forever. He says that in our distress, we can call on the Lord and the Lord will answer us and set us free. That the Lord is for us, so we have nothing to fear. Yes, the Lord is for us. He will help us. The strong arm of the Lord will do these glorious things. So let me, let me make this even more clear, okay? God hates abuse. God never condones the treatment of another human being that diminishes, dismisses, disrespects, or demeans them. 
God does not want you to remain in an abusive relationship, to experience physical, sexual, emotional, mental, or spiritual abuse. Just because, well, you're together, you know, whether that's in a marriage or a family or a friendship or whatever. This is not God's wish for your life. Our God is a God of perfect love who desires to protect and rescue and redeem his people. This is what it means to proclaim God's faithful love that endures forever. His faithful love endures forever. Folks, say that with me. His faithful love endures forever. Amen. As we reflect on, on this message today, I want to invite you to take a message to, or a moment to process and to respond. Again, this is a difficult topic and it's one that we want to both take seriously and we want to respect those who've been victims of abuse. If you'd like to talk or, or have someone pray with you, please reach out. Now let's take some time to come before God today in prayer. Gracious God, we come before you today humbled by your majesty and overwhelmed by your boundless love. As we stand in your presence, we recognize the vastness of your mercy and the depth of your grace. Lord, we lift our hearts to you today in prayer. We know that you are good and powerful and loving. And we know that we really don't understand what it means to love as you do. Lord, we know loving as you do means forgiving. It, it means offering grace. It means working towards restoration and reconciliation. But we also know that you do not condone abuse, that your heart is for those who are abused and victimized and endure such indescribable pain in this life. Lord, we pray for those who have suffered and are suffering even now. We pray that even in these moments that you would comfort them and rescue them and redeem their pain and their suffering. Lord, help us to understand what it means to love as you do and to help us, and help us to be a people, a, a church that offers that love to victims of abuse and that calls those who abuse others to accountability, to repentance, to justice. Give us your strength to understand and to act as you would have us do in all situations, Lord. Father, we're grateful for the promise that in Christ we are new creations. You've promised to take our brokenness and to transform it into beauty. Through the death and resurrection of your Son, we find forgiveness and reconciliation. May the truth of your redemptive work fill us with, with hope and assurance. Lord Jesus, in the midst of our weaknesses, we find our strength in you. Your love, it knows no bounds. And your sacrifice has paved the way for us for life, eternal life. As we fix our eyes on you, may our hearts be filled with the hope that passes all understanding. Lord, in the shadow of your cross, may we find peace and courage to face each day. Spirit of God, we are comforted by your abiding presence. You're our guide and our counselor and our advocate. You remind us of your promises and you lead us into truth. Spirit, empower us by your presence to live according to your will and to radiate your love in all that we do. God, as we come before you with humble hearts, may your forgiveness wash over us, renewing our spirits. Strengthen our hope, deepen our faith, and empower us to live as, as embodiments of your grace and ambassadors of your love. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we now, we join in praying together the Lord's Prayer as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Today we gather not only to worship and celebrate our faith, but also to participate in an essential aspect of our spiritual journey, giving back to God through our offerings. As the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Each of us is invited to take a moment and to reflect on the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. I mean, think about it. All that we have comes from God. And our giving is an act of gratitude, acknowledging that fact. Whether you're giving in person or through digital means today, Remember that your offering is an expression of your commitment to God, to God's love, and to his work in his kingdom. I want to thank you for your generosity and your commitment to God's work. Your cheerful giving makes a difference. It really makes a difference in the lives of so many, and it brings glory to God. Church, let us continue to live as faithful stewards of all that God has entrusted us to. Let's close our time of offering with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you. May our offerings be used to further your work in the world, bringing hope, love, and salvation to those in need. Bless each giver and multiply these gifts for the advancement of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's close our service today with our doxology and then our final song of praise today. God from blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy.
stand strong It shall forevermore endure The saints and angels As we end our time together today, let's join and, and pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us today. May the truths we've encountered in worship and your word guide us throughout the week. As we leave this place, help us to shine your light in our homes, workplaces, and communities. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, as we conclude our time of worship today, I want to invite you to receive this blessing from God's word. May the words of 2 Corinthians 13, 14 remain with us as we leave. <clears throat> the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We hope to see you again next week as we gather to glorify God and grow in our faith together. Have a blessed day, everyone. Amen.